Hi everybody, welcome out to the Dice Tower. My name is Chris Yee. And I'm Wendy Yee. Today we're taking a look at Evacuation. This is a game from Vladimir Suki, the designers, and his company uh, Delicious Games. Mm -hmm. So in this game, you're basically trying to evacuate your people from a dying old planet to a new planet. And I'm going to give you a really brief overview, so uh, let me show you basically how it plays. This is Evacuation. Now in this game, you're trying to move everything from this old dying planet over to a new planet while keeping your people happy and content and growing enough engines and those kind of things. Um, I say engines is in the board game sense, not in actual physical engines on the board. Anywho, there's, a, there's the basic way that you can play that's recommended in the book that a lot of people don't like, so I'm not gonna talk about it much, but basically it's a race, the game suddenly ends, and um, then you just kind of like count up points. So the person who triggers the end by meeting the race could actually lose the game. Um, I'm not going to talk about it because I frankly didn't like it. Now, the other version at the back of the book is just to play across rounds. So we have a round tracker up here. We have four rounds. And at the end of four rounds, then you count up scores based on how well you've moved over your planet and how well you've built up your engine of resource gaining and gathering and stuff. That one's more fun. To start off, I want to talk about the general uh, round structure of the game. So at the beginning of the game, you check for income and you go ahead and you look over here and you say, okay, every single one of these little colors over here is a resource. So if I go one, two, three, four, five, six greens, I would get six green cubes. But guess what? Those cubes only go on the old world side of my board. And then I look over here and I say, hey, um, I don't have to look at the planet. I just look at this nice little track up here and I say, hey, look, I've got two resources in orange and one resource in green. So in my new world, I'm going to go ahead and have those resources right there. Then you have to feed your people. So you look at the round and you see, hey, look, in the old world, I have to pay five food. And in the new world, I have zero because almost nobody lives on the new world. All right, then we have the action phase. You're going to use these cards. Now, these cards have optional uh, backsides. Don't use the backsides. We just use the front um, unless you want to do an advanced module. And what you're going to be doing is you're going to be slotting them for each one of your turns. You're going to move over. Oops, I forgot this. You're going to move over um, and say, hey, for my first action, and then you slot this somewhere and you take one of the actions that's in one of these little regions over here. And then on your next turn, um, after everyone else is gone, then you're going to do it again and you're going to slot like so. And eventually you will have um, multiple cards underneath slots. Then we get to the transport phase. Now I had to fit everything into the screen. So these are not actually my, um, my ships. This is the market for them. But um, what you will be doing is if you have a ship in the old world over here, you can load it up based on what it shows on the top. Um, and then you would actually like physically put cubes and stuff on there. So this can hold one cube and it can hold the stadium and uh, some other good stuff over here. So you would load it up. Um, and then if you had anything in the new world, you would not load it up because you don't want to bring stuff back. And then you'd pay the shipping costs that are required at the top and you would actually ship them and then you would unload um, onto the new side. Okay, then we determine turn order. So turn order is based on happiness. There's certain cards that have smiley faces and the person who has the most smiley faces uh, gets to be first. And so you just go ahead and change turn order up there. Then we have the progress. So this right here is, it, it represents two artificial intelligences that are helping us um, with our technology and stuff. And they're slowly transferring and moving to the new world. And so we have these disks over here. And based on the amount of actions that we've taken in each section times the number that's at the bottom. So I would have three, four, five, six, seven, eight um, movement points. I could then move my um, little artificial intelligence across this. Now this affects a few things. It, it affects where you can build on this board. It also removes some of these um, advancements and then adds them later. I'm sorry, uh, resource. There's like basically like resource engine building stuff and it can add them later depending on these tracks that you move past. I'm not getting into the details, but um, it's important to move past there and land on cool spots that have little icons. Okay, then we look through and we use that same number, so that eight that I used, and then we come and we look over here to see if we got bonuses. Now there's a like nice version and a mean version of how you get bonuses. Um, some it's if you hit the minimum requirement versus some that is like you have to hit it exactly. I had eight, um, so if I'm playing the nice version, I can take the top effect because I got the minimum there. 
Finally, you clean everything up, you reset some stuff, and so it kind of clears everything out. And then you restart again the next round with your income. Now, the next part, I would love to explain all the nitty gritty details of all the actions and all the possibilities and all of that, but then this would be a 15 minute overview and that's too much. So basically, I want to um, kind of stress some of the most important points of the actions of this game. Now, there's markets over here where you can buy different things and that can help you meet objectives, it can help you increase your income and stuff. That's all really cool. But one of the biggest points of this game is that whatever you buy and spend resources for on one side, um, that is that thing that you buy stays on that planet in that side unless it's shipped over. So for example, let's pretend I have some cubes um, and I want to prefabricate a steel factory. I can spend a steel to prefabricate a factory, but this factory can't be placed on the new world because it's fabricated in the old world. Now, if instead I fabricate a factory over in the new world, um, it's here and it's ready to go. So for another action, I can put it down on this world somewhere where there's a factory spot and that can increase my income of that particular resource. Same thing with people. If people are over here, um, which they don't actually sit on this side, they're these people up here, but those people, once you ship them over, become regular people. And then the people over here, which you can clone and add people later too, those can also go on spaces. And then each one of those spaces they cover up will increase your income as well. So that's just one of the main parts of the games that's really important is just that these resources are very separated and whatever is built with on one side or wherever you gain it from on one side, it stays there unless you specifically ship it over. It's all logical, right? They're on different planets. They're across the, you know, the whole solar system or whatever. It makes sense. Um, so that's a big thing of that. Now talking about the end game with the points module specifically, not the race mode that's recommended. Everyone will have objective cars. You meet those objectives, you get points for them. That's pretty sweet. That's not in the other version. And then you also go through and you look at your income. So you say income, you took, you take your lowest one. So this one would be the steal. And then you say how many points you'd get. So I would get seven points for that. You lose points if you've not moved people over to the new world, if you don't have enough stadiums, um, if you don't have enough food for feeding people, just like stuff like that. You have to meet those certain objectives. Otherwise you lose end game points. And then finally, um, the person with the most happiness. And then there's just a little like, majorities thing over here. Whoever has the most happiness gets the most points. So um, in this points mode, it really matters what your income is. It matters happiness. It matters that you've met a lot of these objectives of getting to the new world, but you don't have to have met them all, which in the race mode, you basically had to, otherwise you can't win. So there you go. That's the basics. Just really briefly how to play evacuation. So real quick clarification between the two modes, the actual like structure of the game is all the same except for what triggers the end game and then how the end game points work. So the actual actions and all that kind of stuff and the round structure, all that's the same. Yeah, and I think that's a good thing, right? Because then it's not too hard to switch between the two variants. I think we should just address the, uh, the elephant in the room right now and say that we both have a preference as to which of the two modes is the race mode and the points mode. Yeah, the race mode just ends really abruptly. And so you could have this big turn plan where you're going to ship all your people over and you're just going to like beast this game and win. And then someone's like, oh, I triggered the end game. And so you're like, okay, well, now we have to do the end game scoring. And now we're all going to lose a bunch of stuff. It's very procedural of an end game. Very. For something called race mode, at the end, it like bogs down into, okay, let's go through and count all these negatives, move all these, you know. And so it's, it's um, for me, a frustrating way to play it. Then we tried the points mode after mm -hmm. playing that, and I thought, this is kind of what I want for a few different reasons. One, I really enjoy the systems going on in the game, mm -hmm. so I want to just be able to marinate in those systems without that threat of someone triggering the, you know, the end of the game. And not being able to do what you were set up to do. Yeah, because this game is about ramping up. It is. So if you've ramped up, you want to be able to take those really big, you know, mm -hmm. game-shaking actions that you've built up for. Yeah, because it's such an engine builder and you're specifically trying to build up that new engine. So yeah, I totally agree. The other thing is, is I've taught multiple groups the race system and partway through the game and then three quarters of the way through the game, it's like, now I have to remind you all of the 15 step process that's gonna happen at the end of the game that's gonna make you all angry 
And they, you know, I mean, people still forget what's going to happen because it doesn't make sense till you see it. Yes, yes. Second point, easier to teach points mode. Third point of why I prefer the uh, or easier to teach points mode. Yeah, not raise. Third reason I prefer that one by far is that it introduces these little in-game objectives that you can use. Which are great. They're fun. You know, this is a very kind of open form game. Mm -hmm. Destroy your old engine, build up your new engine, shipping and all that stuff, kind of how you want to. It gives you a lot of leash that you can hang yourself or accomplish a lot. And so I, I find that for me, the way I like playing games, having those little objectives that you work towards is a little bit of direction and some extra bonuses that you get that's just very satisfying. Yeah, I agree. One thing that I really love about this game is that everything thematically fits with the actual mechanics of the game. So every mechanic that is there, I can come up with a thematic reason to explain why it's happening. Why do I have to shift? Like, why do I have to move my spaceships? Why do I have to gain a cube on the old world? Why can't I use it on the new world? Like, all of that stuff makes a lot of sense thematically. And so I can look at everything and explain it well when I teach. I, I agree with that, right? Like, it's, it's not hard to figure out, hey, old world production, right? As we're trying to flee from the old world, you have less engines mm -hmm. built up there. You're producing le you fewer resources on that old planet. But also you have less need for it. And so it, it even though part of your engine that you're just ramping up is, is falling apart, the need for it is also diminishing. Yeah. But is it 100% diminishing? Well, you know, maybe not at a commensurate rate. That's kind of for you to figure out. So well, I guess I like that this game gives you a lot of that freeform stuff. One thing that I appreciate, which also comes back to a thematic element, is that the amount of food and stadiums that you need is planned out in the beginning, which makes sense from a, a planning logistics perspective. A whole world is not going to evacuate and then be like, we don't know how many people are going to show up on the new world. <laughs> like you know ahead of time, right? You know how many people were there originally and how many people are going to be there at the end. And so I really appreciate being able to see ahead and plan ahead to know what those costs are going to be because you can you can save those costs for the very end and just barely squeeze by and get them. Or you can get them early on and be like, cool, I'm just done. I'm taken care of. I have enough food for, for decades. I have enough stadiums for the rest of the game. Like, I'm good. I, I do that when I play this game where I have some extra stuff. And I'm like, ooh, this is going to pay for my, you know, feed my people at the end of each round. And so I, like, set it to the side. This is my working pool of resources. And then I exhaust that. And I'm like, well. I can dip in. I can dip in. <laughs> Because this, yeah, this game is tight. I think the biggest detractor that people are going to find is that the there's a good amount of rules and rules overhead. And secondly, the resources are extremely tight in they this really game. They really Multiple are. Multiple resources. The cubes representing the food and the energy and all that stuff. But also just the action economy. Mm -hmm. As you take more actions, you have to spend more energy. Yeah. But you're then also going to get more satellite movement at the end of the round. And do you really want to move your satellites that far? Because what if you're not prepared to deal with the consequences of having your satellites in the second half of the track? And the, You know what I mean? Because usually satellite movement is good, but early on in the game, it's removing some of your income from the old world. Right. So it's like, yeah. And then it's also dictating, you know, as, as you get past the halfway point, you're like, okay, now you have to spend more resources from your new world. They have to come from there. And you're like, but what if I'm not ready for it? I'm not built up yet. So it, it's an extremely tight game. Yeah, it is. I agree. One thing that I, another thing I like about the game is there are these infrastructure cards in it, which I did not go into practically at all. Um, but basically you have to create some sort of um, configuration on the new world. So it may say like, hey, have two things in the tundra area in the same line. You know what I mean? Like it's very, it's very specific, like what regions you're building in and stuff. And then it just gives you straight up new income. And those cards are so powerful and they're so cool to be able to try to figure out how can I lay out my stuff so that I maximize all of these cards and I can, you know, get extra income from them. But at the same time, you're like, or I could just put stuff out and get straight up income by just putting the things out. Oh, there's better spots that aren't in a row with each other. So maybe I am getting overall better stuff. And that's, yeah, it's a, it's a, really it's a, good. It's a fun problem to have, trying yeah. to say, hey, do I work on this card? Do I just grab the best spot before Wendy gets to it? Because she's going to take that. Right. So, yeah, I, I find so much satisfaction from all the stuff going on in this game, except for I have a very hard time remembering the general rule set 
if I haven't played this game like immediately, like in the last week or so, it's a bit of work to come back to it. There is a lot. It is a, I would consider this a heavy game. Like there's a lot to it. Um, luckily the round structure card, I feel like having that in front of you can really help you, you know, play and flow through the game. Um, but at the end of the day, like I said, everything thematically fits. Do you have a score for this that's, that you have in mind? Oh, this is one of the hardest parts of being a reviewer. I love this game. I have a lot of fun playing it, but I'm also now, it's been a few weeks since we mm -hmm. played it last, and, you know, or since I played it, you played it more recently than me even, and I just sit there and think, like, I don't know the next time I'm going to come back to this yeah. because of just that, that overhead and the time that it takes. But it's so fun, and it kind of stands apart, even though there are games that do, um, a, a comparable game to this almost is, is on Mars from mm -hmm. Vital Lacerda, right? You have the two different, you have the on Mars side and then you have the space station side sure. and you're balancing. It has some notes of that and I feel like that this one does it even smoother. And so I love a lot about this game. I think my score is going to come down at an eight though mm -hmm. because I'm hesitant to come back to it. I'm hesitant to teach it. And that might not be an issue for you. If you enjoy what's going on here and you say, yeah, those are non-concerns for me, Chris, mm -hmm. then your score is going to be absolutely higher. I get that. For me, the mix between like the 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 befuddling rule book, um, the rule book saying play with the race mode where you have to deal with like just these end game issues that are hard to teach, harder to teach, harder to internalize. Mm -hmm. I think make the ending of the game less fun uh, and can prematurely cut it short before you get to do your big yes. power moves in the last round. Then. You know, all of that factored in, and 8 is a fantastic score. Mm -hmm. Let me just say, I really like this game. And so, uh, I don't want to sound too negative and also give it a very high score. It's interesting because I was thinking, I was like, what would my score be based on the race mode? And I was like, I think I'd have to give it a 6 on the race mode. If you were to rate a jest on that. Because I like the mechanics so much, but I hated the race mode so intensely. And I was just frustrated with it every time I taught it. But the actual game, like taking that aside and completely erasing that, like this is a nine for me. I loved it. This was my favorite game from last year. And I really struggled when I was making my top 10 games of last year because I was like, I love this the way I want to play it. I don't love it the way it's recommended to play it in the rule book. And so um, once I was able to set that aside, and then after I talked to a lot of other people, a lot of other people also like the points mode and prefer that, I was like, cool. That's just what it is to me. This game is the points mode. The race mode is like some side module you don't have to do. It's not included in my mind. Sure, so and that's a very. This is a straight up nine. I think that it's so clever and such a unique feeling game because you are really using those two different types of resources. It reminds me of an 18xx game where you have um, the different uh, stock markets. Like you have the different stocks, and they each have their own. Like businesses have their own <laughs> economies. This feels mm -hmm. like that. Only they they end up shifting to each other. And, and they're so, both yours, 100%. Yeah, they're both yours, 100%. And so I really enjoy the way that that works. I love building up on the board and, and trying to progress to newer areas so that you can get better, stronger areas that you can fulfill. I love the cards. I love the ships. I just, I like all of this. This game is a ton of fun. So this is a, hands down a nine for me. All right, there you go. Uh, like I said, both of us really enjoy this game, and uh, I think the difference is that you're, you have more desire to come back to this one more Oh, definitely. And I've played this already, like, twice as many times as you. Right. Because I enjoyed it so much. Yeah. But anyway, uh, the, a high score of a 9, giving Evacuation a seal of excellence from us here mm -hmm. at the Dice Tower. Uh, great another new game from Vladimir Suki. I think one of Delicious Games' best in a while, actually. Yeah. So thanks for joining us today. I'm Wendy Yi. And I'm Chris Yi. And go ahead and evacuate from this video. We'll see you next time. Hey! Sponge or something? Like it <clears throat> yes, because pointy. the metal part has just broken through. Oh, uh, okay. Probably because so many people hit their heads on that light. Probably. So then the metal part's sticking through, making it worse to hit your head on that light. Uh-huh.
This place is a walking OSHA violation.